Singapore's gender pay gap has narrowed, standing at 6% in 2018, down from 8.8% in 2002. That's the key finding in a report by the Manpower Ministry and National University of Singapore, which also found that the gap here is smaller than in other developed countries like the US and Canada. And joining us to discuss this further is sociology professor Pauline Strong from Singapore Management University. Thank you Welcome for having to me. the show. Always nice to have you. Now, uh, let's have a look, okay? Mm. We've uh, seen this overall improvement in the gender pay gap. And as we mentioned, it was something like 8.8. .8, mm -hmm. And now it's improved to 6%. So that's about a 2.8% improvement in 16 years, uh, Professor. Is, is, is that a, an enough of an improvement to see over that mm. period of time? Um, the 6% is the adjusted gender pay gap. But the unadjusted gender pay gap is 16.3%. So it means that the difference, the average difference of 16.3%, well, about 10% could be accounted for, right? Um, so, so the interesting news here is twofold. First, that we could account for about 7% of that difference due to occupation differences. So being in certain occupations, you know, uh, result in lower average salaries. And these salaries, these occupations with lower median salaries tend to be predominated dominated by women. So that's one important consideration that I think is noteworthy and newsworthy. Okay. The second, of course, is the 6% that is still unaccounted for. So that's, well, anyone's guess, you know, what could be that difference? And of course, Discrimination is one of the possible, you know, uh, explanatory uh, reasons. But I think invisible work is probably the key factor here. That 6% that's unaccounted for, probably due to the fact that women do a lot of caregiving at mm. home. So they are not in the labor force mm -hmm. or they become part-timers. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, like, I want to pick up on something you said there, mm. which was quite interesting. With It's got to do with discrimination. So a lot of women are also in positions of um, professional jobs as well as men, but men somehow still overrepresent the number uh, you know, of, of that position. And mm. women are still, as you said earlier, in low paying jobs. Why? Why is that the case? Mm. We could talk for like hours <laughs> on this, right? I think that probably over time, women's work was not as valued because of power disparities between men and women in decision-making uh, positions and who is in authority and so forth. But I think moving forward, it's probably not as productive if we keep talking about it in terms of discrimination because it polarizes you know, the community. I mean, the fact that we, we have raised this to consciousness that for women and men who are just as educated, that's the important point here, right? You know, this, this report also uh, showcases the gains that Singapore has made, right, in terms of you know, pulling up, you know, the, the status of women mm. through education. So at this point, there is, you know, hardly any difference between the education achievements of women compared to their male uh, counterparts. So it has highlighted, you know, an important consideration in terms of occupation segregation, that there are certain segments in our economy that are undervalued. Now, so what are these, right? Because, you know, with technology, you know, it's mainstreaming, redesigning jobs and so forth, it is understandable that some jobs will dissipate. So, clerical, for example, right? We see dampened salaries, but we also see a shrinking pool because most of us now are expected to do our own clerical work. However, the important occupations highlighted here, nursing, teaching, among others. So for an aging population, is it healthy for us to continue to have dampened wages for caring professions? Whether or not they are staffed mainly by men or women should be a secondary consideration. The primary consideration is, do we want to attract talent and younger Singaporeans into these important 
occupations? And if the answer is yes, then if, it, if we can attribute 7% of the age difference, uh, the wage differentials between men and women to occupation status, right? The segregation of, of occupation, then this is something that we can address progressively. I think the other important takeaway from here is that 6% that is unaccounted for, um, so all kinds of speculations or hypotheses, but one important one would be the invisibility of caregiving work. So it could be caregiving for children, caregiving for aged parents and family. But, you know, our concern with low fertility and, and how and if women can manage work-life balance, then if that 6%, you know, it could be due largely to the setback women suffer when they engage in childcare, child rearing, parenting responsibilities, but that's something that we should actively look into because it has long-term consequences on the health and well-being of our society. Um, I, I like a lot of what you said, but as time is running out, I, I'm wondering, uh, would you be able to say how far we are from achieving a, a zero percent wage gap? And what are some of the obstacles that still lie in our way? I think the main obstacle is just not knowing how to address this. So, so even you know, the most open-minded you know, policy maker would say, yes, there is a problem. We have a problem, we have to address it. But the question then is how, right? So actually we have done it, you know, not because there's gender discrimination, but because there's dampened wages in important sectors. So an example is the security sector, mm -hmm. right? We, we realize that it's not attracting the right mm -hmm. people. Yeah. So we should look into nursing, we should look into, into teaching and caregiving roles. Right, it was always good to have you with us, uh, you. Professor Pauline Strawn from the Singapore Management University speaking uh, with us this evening.